Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us on this webinar brought to you by the McMaster Alumni Association. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gabriel. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Geography and Earth Sciences. I'm a geologist. I study the Earth, um, and I'm excited to be here today to answer your questions about plate tectonics and the natural disasters that they cause. Um, we did get a lot of questions, so I'm going to try and answer as many as possible. And with that being said, let's get this show going. So, our first question, um, and it's a great place to start, comes from Jack from Hamilton, a grade eight student. And Jack asked, is it true that South America was once connected to Africa? The answer to that question is yes. And in fact, all of the continents at one point were connected together to form one large supercontinent that uh, we geologists refer to as Pangaea. Um, so this is a snapshot of what the Earth roughly would have looked like about 250 million years ago um, in an era called the Permian period. Um, <clears throat> about 300 million years ago, all the continents were together. And how do we know this? Well, a man named Alfred Wegener uh, first proposed this idea of continental drift, and he was looking at patterns of um, fossils and glacial striations. We'll look at those next. And what he noticed was that you can find fossil remains of land reptiles, uh, freshwater reptiles, and plants, and you can find these across all of the continents. And now these are animals and plants, certainly plants, that are not going to be able to traverse large oceans if the continents were in the orientation that they are today. And we also noticed that Fossils of ferns were found down in Antarctica, and certainly Antarctica does not have any plants on it today. In fact, it has four kilometers worth of ice on top of it. Um, here we can see glacial striations, these really nice grooves in the rock that are all going in a single direction. We can see these moving nicely here. If you're ever in, ever in Northern Ontario or British Columbia and you're on a nice big flat piece of rock, take a look down, see if you can see the glacial striations. And the direction of these striations just doesn't make a whole lot of sense if the planet, if the continents are in the orientation on the planet that they are today. But if they are all close together and down closer to the South Pole, the arrows and the directions of these striations make a lot more sense. So if the continents were in that position before, then why aren't they in that position anymore? And that's going to lead us into our conversation about tectonic plates. Currently, the Earth has 15 tectonic plates, and this is a representation of all of them. Of course, we can see that the Pacific plate wraps around um, the outside, and the North American plate and Antarctic plate would be wrapped on the bottom. Um, and these plates are always moving around and changing. For example, the Arabian plate that we can see sitting up here is currently moving up to the northeast and is being pushed underneath the Eurasian plate as it separates from Africa. The Indian plate as well is still colliding with Eurasia this way, and that's what's causing the Himalayas to grow. The Himalayan mountains actually grow by about six centimeters every year, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you take that over 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, that suddenly becomes a lot more growth that these mountains are experiencing. Um, just quickly for Daniel from Marmora, he asked if there is um, any kind of tool that he can use for looking at what the Earth looked like um, at previous times. And in fact, there is. This is a fantastic uh, link, Earth Viewer from BioInteractive. I'm going to take a quick second to switch to that screen. Hopefully it comes through for you guys. And what you can see is you have a picture of the Earth, very similar to Google Earth, and we can rotate this around and let's take a look at North America just so we know where we are. We've got Toronto, we've got New York, you can zoom in and you can zoom out. And then what you can do is you can take this slider and you can move the earth back through time. And this is all based off geologic reconstruction of rocks that are found, um, sediment deposits that are found, 
And so you can actually get a look at what the Earth looked like through time. Now, there's lots of different things on here. Warming Earth, we can look at how temperature patterns are changing. Ice Age Earth, we can look at the growth of ice sheets. So this is a really great um, interactive viewer, uh, and I really encourage everybody to take a look at it if, um, if they can get to it. That's Earth Viewer by BioInteractive. And bear with me as I bring my presentation back up again. Sorry about that. Okay, and we're back. So there's the link for the Earth Viewer Interactive, and that was asked by Daniel from Marmora. So we've talked about the plate tectonics. We've talked about how uh, the, co the continents have moved around. So Diego from Ancaster um, asked, how do plate tectonics, tectonic plates shift? And then followed up from that, Mark, an alumnus from Brantford, asks, will that ever stop? So the answer to how they move is a process known as convection. And convection is the idea of warm fluid, warm air, warm liquid rising. As it rises, though, it's getting away from its heat source and it's cooling down. So as it cools, it's going to sink back down. Any of the adults who are taking part in this presentation will certainly call to mind a lava lamp. Some of the younger students may not know what a lava lamp looks like, but if you've ever seen a lava lamp, that is uh, convection in action. These, these waxy blobs floating up and, and then cooling down and sinking back down to the bottom. And so that process is what's driving the motion of the tectonic plates. So as the heat comes up, it hits the crust and it can't go anywhere other than laterally. And so this, this moves the plates along on kind of like a conveyor. As it's moving these plates along, it's cooling down because it's further away from the source of heat. Um, that package, that parcel of warm uh, fluid magma is going to then start sinking, get back down to the core where it's going to heat up again and rise up again. And this is the constant process that is driving tectonic plate motion. And then um, Mark's question about will this process ever run out? Well, yes, this fuel will absolutely run out in time. We don't have infinite sources of energy um, on the planet. We don't have infinite sources of energy in the universe. Um, right now, we have two sources of heat which are driving um, the convection process. The first one is actually primordial heat. This is heat that's left over from the formation of the planet four and a half billion years ago. As it's being all swirled around in this gas cloud as the sun is um, forming, it starts to, to compress and gravity starts to pull the particles together. And as they condense, everything starts heating up. So that's the primordial heat. We also then have heat which is actively being generated from radioactive decay. Um, mainly through the decay of uranium, thorium, and potassium. For our younger viewers, I understand those elements might not mean anything, um, but what happens is these, these elements break down, and every time they break down, they release energy. They release energy in the form of heat. Um, so these are our two sources of heat. Now, scientists know how much heat flows from the core to space, about 44 terawatts, and just to compare, 44 terawatts is about 1 billion microwaves. A microwave outputs about a kilowatt worth of energy. Um, so 1 billion microwaves worth of energy are going out from the core to space. But the problem is we don't know how much of that energy is primordial, and we don't know how much energy of that is radioactive. And then compounding that even further, we don't even know how much fuel is left, which is um, keeping the radioactive decay and keeping that heat going. Um, these are things that scientists are currently trying to figure out and currently trying to model. Um, there are researchers who believe that by 2025-ish, we should have an idea at least how much radioactive fuel is left in our planet. As everything cools down, the earth and these plates, these the lithosphere it's called, these tectonic plates, as this mantle starts to cool, it's gonna to start to contract. It's gonna to start to bring itself in. As that happens, all of this rock, all of these tectonic plates are gonna to fall together and they're gonna end up fusing together. And uh, that's when tectonic motion will shut down on the planet. Um, and we will have something very similar to the moon. The moon did have tectonics at one point. 
it has now cooled down and become uh, almost a solid crust. So uh, moving on, now let's look at how the plates move. And Carlos, a grade 10 student from Ancaster, asked why are some tectonic plates more likely to cause disasters than others? Um, and that's a great question. And it has to do with what type of boundary the plates are looking at. So this is just a uh, simple diagram that we can see that shows the different plate boundaries. And we have three plate boundaries. We have a divergent plate boundary, which is this here, where the plates are moving away from each other. These are very calm um, locations. You don't have volcanoes. You do have earthquakes, but it's not the same as the earthquakes that we get over here, the big ones. These earthquakes happen because as this gets further and further apart, these rocks are going to have to slip and fall. They're going to fill in that gap that's in the middle there. So they get shakes and they get quakes, but it's not the same as what we get in a convergent zone. So this here, we have a convergent zone where we have this plate going this way and we have this plate coming this way. This is similar to what is happening on the west coast of Canada right now. The North American plate, you could picture this as the Cascade Mountains um, of Northern Washington and getting up into uh, British Columbia. These could possibly be the Rocky Mountains. Um, these areas are areas where you start building up a lot of energy as these rocks are rubbing past each other. And you can do a little kind of experiment with this and see how this works. If you take your two hands and rub them slowly together, you feel your hands, you don't really feel any heat, and you don't really hear any sound. These are just nicely moving. If you push and you put some pressure there and you start feeling that energy and your arms might actually even start shaking and then they slip and you'll hear a little of, of air, that's energy being released. All that energy that you built up as you were doing this suddenly gets released. That's similar to what's happening um, on these convergent zones where you have this subducting plate. All this energy is starting to build up um, in here. So these areas are where we get our most dangerous and our most violent natural disasters. Um, areas where we have divergent um, it, are not quite as, as dangerous. Um, so Matthew from Mississauga asked, why can't we drill, if we know all this heat is down there, as we've talked about, why can't we just drill to the Earth's core and use all that heat to make our energy um, instead of using fossil fuels? And that's a great thought, and it's something that we actually do use. The thing is, drilling down to the core, it's just too far. Here's an image, um, just a general looking at how thick um, the continental crust is. And as you can see, this is where we would start getting some fluid magma. Um, and again, fluid is a, is a loose term I'm using here, but this is where we would have to drill to. And as you can see, on the continent, that could be about 150 kilometers deep. Um, in the ocean, yes, it's shallower, maybe 100 kilometers, but that means we have to build a lot of infrastructure out here in the ocean. If we wanted to get down to the liquid core, the liquid core is 3,000 kilometers deep. So really, really deep, way, way too far for us to go. However, we do collect geothermal energy and there's lots of places in Canada and there are lots of places even here in Ontario that collect geothermal energy. And what this does is it puts pipes into the ground. It buries pipes deep in the ground, sometimes six feet, sometimes you're going, um, excuse me, six feet, two meters, sometimes you're going down to five meters and you're putting pipes in the ground that are filled with a fluid, not water, it's a special type of fluid. And this fluid is, is like a heat sink. And so in the summertime, this fluid is connected by pipes to your house. It's going to draw any excess heat from your house into this fluid and store it in the ground. In the wintertime, it's going to take that heat and it's going to put it back into your house. Now, this is not heat on the order like if you, say, turn on your electric heat. You're not going to get blasts of hot air. But what it can do is it can keep your house at a stable 10 to 11 degrees Celsius, which means that it's much less heat that you'd have to put in in the winter to warm it up. And it's going to act to draw all of that heat down in the summertime. So you'll have to use your air conditioner less. Um, some people in Ontario uh, have 
commented on about 50% decrease in the amount of energy that they use from their hydro bill if they have this geothermal energy put in. So yes, geothermal energy is something that we can do and we do not need to drill down the 3,000 3, kilometers uh, to get all the way to the liquid core. So thank you for that question, Matthew. Now we are going to uh, move on to volcanoes. We're actually going to start looking at some of these natural disasters caused by um, the tectonic plate motion. We have uh, two very drastically different pictures here of volcanoes. Leandro, a grade four student from Ancaster, asked, are volcanic eruptions related to tectonic plates? Yes, absolutely they are related to tectonic plates. And I'm going to bring us back to this picture again here. We have generally two types of volcanoes that we talk about in geology. We have shield volcanoes, and they happen over hotspot plumes. Hawaii is an example of shield volcanoes. And this type of lava is um, very liquid. It can flow. You get calm, continuous eruptions. If you ever see video of volcanic eruptions in Hawaii, it almost looks like um, flaming uh, uh, oil flowing down the road. And you can certainly outrun it. Um, it is way too hot. It will destroy everything in its path, but you can get away from it. On the other hand, we have stratovolcanoes. Here's a stratovolcano, and here's a stratovolcano. And what we notice, again, these stratovolcanoes, they are associated with this subducting plate, this very high energy zone, this zone of danger. These, the lava is not able to flow. The lava Picture it more like peanut butter, and it's going to start building, or, or caramel, caramel maybe, because it's because it's stickier, and it's going to start building up energy over time, and eventually that energy is going to become too much, the same way as when we were sliding our hands like this, that energy is going to become too much, and it's going to explode. So, Aditya, I hope I pronounced that properly, a grade six student from Ottawa, asked, where did the biggest volcanic eruption happen? and will it happen again? And the term biggest is a little bit misleading. Um, so I'm gonna change that to most powerful because the biggest we could be referring to which releases the most amount of lava over time. Um, in that case, Hawaii is actually a lot bigger than what Krakatoa would be. Um, but in terms of the most powerful, uh, one of the most powerful was the eruption of Krakatoa. And what we can see here on the screen, this is an image from Google Earth. So this is a satellite image of the planet. And we see this very sharp line, this very sharp drop. This sharp drop is representative of a subduction zone. So again, here we are on our subduction zone. It's no surprise that we get these really strong, powerful volcanoes um, erupting here. This particular eruption, which happened in 1883, was large enough to be heard in Perth, Australia. Perth sits a little further south just down here on this picture. And uh, Mauritius, which are islands kind of over here. Mauritius is about uh, 4,500 kilometers away. So that would be similar to somebody in Halifax hearing an explosion that happened in Vancouver. That's how loud this explosion was. And this explosion generated pressure waves. Pressure waves come out from any explosion. These pressure waves were so powerful, they actually circled the planet three times and measuring equipment around the planet picked up this pressure wave circle around and around again. So a very, very massive explosion. Um, the death toll estimate was about uh, 36,000 people at the time. Um, and so then the question, the follow-up question that Aditya had is, will this happen again? And yes, it absolutely will happen again. Um, Krakatoa is currently starting to, is actively spewing ash and lava right now. Um, the column of ash can go up to a kilometer or two into the sky, uh, which is low relative to the, to the eruption. The eruption caused the ash to go about 15 kilometers high into the sky. Um, and so what I've done here is I've shown us a picture of Mount St. Helens. So this is a different uh, volcano. It's also a stratovolcano, very much like Krakatoa. The reason I use this is because the satellite imagery over the United States is much clearer than it is over Indonesia. Um, any of the parents on this call will either remember or they know of the Mount St. Helens eruption from 1980. And 
1980, this whole wall, you can see where the mountain used to go and it would have been a peak that grew up like this. The whole thing exploded out this direction. Okay. And that formed what's called a caldera or a crater in the middle. But what do we notice? We notice that, hey, wait a minute, we've got another peak that's starting to grow in the middle of this caldera. That's evidence that this is still an active volcano. There is still an active ma magma chamber be beneath it, and this is going to continue to grow. Will it get to the point where it explodes again in such a massive way? That is very difficult to predict uh, because we don't know if there are now ways that the energy can be released slowly over time as opposed to being released all at once in one big massive explosion. And so that's similar, that's happening in, uh, at Krakatoa. Um, it's happening at Mount Vesuvius, which if anybody remembers is what destroyed the city of Pompeii. Um, it's happening in the Italian island of Santorini. Um, all of these volcanoes are, that are still active, you see this, this inner peak inside the caldera, which is indicating that yes, indeed, this, this is still active. Moving on to earthquakes. And I'm just showing a couple of pictures here. This is from the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. I bring this up because this shows you the displacement that occurred as a result of this earthquake. This fence was together. The farmer did not build this fence with a four foot gap in between. But as a result of the earthquake and as a result of the plates sliding past each other like this, that's the amount of offset that happened in that earthquake in 1906. And then here's an image of the earthquake from Haiti in 2010. Um, what you notice here is the lack of solid building structures like uh, countries like Japan have. Japan is very well situated um, to deal with oncoming earthquakes because uh, they have codes built into their buildings, building codes, um, to make sure that they withstand. Haiti does not, and you can see that's why there was so much devastation and Haiti has not actually fully recovered from that earthquake 10 years ago. But getting to the questions, um, Nolan, a grade three student from Dundas, asked where in Canada is the most common area for earthquakes? And hopefully uh, at this point in the presentation, everybody is starting to think, okay, um, earthquakes, we're looking for subduction zones and we have our subduction zone over here on the west coast of Canada, right? This very sharp line. In contrast, if you take a look at the east coast of Canada, we have all of this blue, this shallower water, which then um, dips off into the Atlantic. This is not a plate boundary. This is just where the continental plate goes off onto the ocean and goes into the very, very deep ocean. The plate boundary is in the middle of the Atlantic. And actually you can faintly see this stitch of a line. This is the mid ocean ridge. This is the plate boundary. This is where the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are slowly moving away from each other and making the Atlantic ocean bigger. Um, so the, uh, most common place for earthquakes are going to be on the west coast of Canada. That's not to say that we don't get small earthquakes around here. I'm going to come to that, that question in a little bit. Um, a student asked about that. Um, and this subduction zone is a result of the North American plate, which, as I mentioned, is moving away from Eurasia. So it's opening up the Atlantic. But as it moves, it has to go somewhere it's going over top of the Pacific plate and it's riding over top of the Pacific plate and forcing that one down. That's our subduction zone. So we have Mount St. Helens, the big volcano that I just showed you right here. We have um, earthquakes that have happened, subduction earthquakes that have happened here. Moving along, then Madeline asks, um, following up from that question, how well are experts able to predict when earthquakes and tsunami will occur? And that's a very difficult thing to do. We can't actually predict when an earthquake will happen. The best we can do is use what scientists, and this is not just in geology, this happens in a lot of things, is what's called a return period. So what we do is we look at how many earthquakes have we seen or have we been able to record in this area over a certain amount of time? And that allows us to predict 
or to estimate, I should say, not predict, um, when a, another earthquake may happen. And so what we see down here is we see that these crustal faults, they're called, don't worry about what crustal faults are, they're just cracks that are up in the crust, they're pretty shallow. They don't create very big earthquakes, maximum at a seven, um, and they happen roughly every hundreds of years, right? We had one, um, uh, but we don't have a great return period on that. Um, we have some deep earthquakes, which happen roughly every 30 to 50 years. Then we have these big, massive subduction zone quakes, greater than a nine. These are your big earthquakes. Think of the Fukushima earthquake that happened in 2011, um, for those of us who are old enough to go back to 2011. Um, or if you think of the tsunami um, from 2004, the Boxing Day tsunami, uh, that tsunami was caused by an earthquake at a subduction zone like this, a massive nine on the Richter scale. These have a recurrence period of roughly 500 to 600 years. Now, you will notice the last subduction zone earthquake we had was in 1700, was 300 years ago, which means the west coast of Canada is coming dangerously close to potentially having another earthquake again. That's if all of this energy gets built up and released at once. Possibly the energy could be re released over time in smaller earthquakes like this, and then we wouldn't get the big one, but we just don't know that. We just, it, it's very, very difficult to model. So that's why it's so difficult to predict when an earthquake will happen. Once an earthquake happens, then it becomes easier to predict the tsunami. The problem is the speed at which tsunamis can travel across the ocean. The tsunamis will travel um, across the ocean at hundreds of kilometers an hour. So even if an earthquake happens in off the coast of um, North America like this, there's no way you would have time to warn people of the tsunami, to warn these folk on the east on the west coast of Vancouver Island of the incoming tsunami. Um, you would be able to warn people on the other side of the Pacific. So in Japan, would that give them enough time to actually get up and get out of the way? Uh, that, um, that we're not totally sure of. It would de depend on the size of the earthquake, how big that, uh, that tsunami wave was. Um, and I provided another link down here uh, that people can see once my uh, toolbar goes away. Um, CSZ stands for the Cascadia Subduction Zone. Um, and that's all the work that's being done to study. As you can see, Scientists recognize that this is a very dangerous area. We have a lot of people living over here. So we want to do the best we can to model and understand so that we can, we can have the best estimates of when we might get another earthquake. So I encourage everybody to take a look at, uh, at their website, um, the Pacific Northwest subduction, um, excuse me, subduction zone. All right. Moving along, and now this is, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, Megan, a grade eight student from Hamilton asked, if Ontario doesn't sit on a fault line, why do we sometimes feel small earthquakes? And that goes back, I'm gonna go back a slide quickly. That goes back to these crustal faults that we have. Um, rock is very strong, but also very brittle. Once you get a crack, in, once you start applying pressure to a rock, it's going to break and it's going to crack. It's not going to um, fold or bend uh, like an elastic. You can kind of picture if you find a really old elastic in a drawer and it's kind of all cracked and you pull it, it just immediately breaks apart. Whereas if you have a, a good new elastic, it'll stretch and it'll expand and it'll go back. Um, so rocks are very brittle and they're very easy to break. So this is um, a map that's put on by um, Seismic Canada. And again, this is something that we know about. We can measure earthquakes um, um, very, very accurately. Predicting them becomes very difficult. So what we can see is that in Southern Ontario in particular, we get a lot of earthquakes actually happening that are only about a three on the, on the Richter scale. 
you very rarely would you feel a three maybe if you were at the top of a really high building because that that wave is going to get amplified as you move up the building you might kind of feel um, um, dizzy you might kind of feel a little bit off put um, a four and a five you will start feeling on the ground um, I personally have sat um, not close to a five but have felt the effects of a larger earthquake um, sitting on the ground and yeah again I was just sitting there and suddenly I felt really really dizzy and then it went away and that's because the earth was moving but but not drastically so I was shaking in my chair um, so that's where the earthquakes come from. And it's from all these little small crustal faults. Um, the, the crust of North America in particular is still actually rebounding up since the last ice age. At the height of the last ice age um, in Hamilton around Toronto area, we had roughly two kilometers of ice sitting on top of us. Two kilometers of ice weighs millions of tons and it actually depresses the rock and it depresses the earth down into the mantle which is kind of like a fluid it would be like pushing down on an ice cube that's floating in a glass of water once all that ice is gone well now this rock is coming back up and it's rebounding back up and as it rebounds again this is rock this is not elastic so as it rebounds it's going to be cracking and it's going to be moving in different ways and so these crustal faults get activated at different times and that's what causes us to feel um, earthquakes in Ontario even though we are not on a subduction zone what we will not get in Ontario is a mega quake something in the seven eight nine range that's not possible because we don't have that subduction zone there we're not sitting on that fault line um, or on a transform fault line like in San Francisco um, so once again anybody who's sorry anybody who's interested in this you can take a look at the link that's on the bottom of the screen um, from the Canadian government and uh, this they don't just do the southern Great Lakes they do all of Ontario they do into Quebec and you can take a look at um, how earthquakes are distributed throughout Ontario um, and so we're coming up to just our final question. I hope people have been able to bear with me here. I hope this has been interesting. Um, we had a last minute question from Judah, five years old. Um, and Judah wanted to know if fish can swim through tsunami, tsunamis. Um, and Judah, that's an excellent question. And it's a great thing to think about, uh, something that I, as a geologist, I study rocks. I don't often focus on the biota, on living organisms. Um, but it's something interesting to think about. And so where that comes in and is what's called wave base. How deep does the wave affect the water? And what we can see here is that in the deeper ocean, even really big waves, once you get to a certain point, there's not enough energy left in that wave. All that energy is focused up here in the top. So any fish that were living down in this area they wouldn't even know that a tsunami happened. They probably wouldn't even move anywhere in the water column. Fish that are living kind of here, they might feel some kind of sway. They might, they might move around a little bit, but maybe not noticed. These poor fish that are living close to the shore where the waves can hit the bottom, these fish are going to um, experience the full force of the tsunami. And they are going to be tossed around. They won't be able to swim through this um, and they will be washed up on shore. And in fact, uh, just recently, it was just last year actually, that scientists discovered um, a fish deposit in North Dakota of the United States. And I bring this up, this, is a, this, this blew my mind. This was fascinating to me. Um, so we've got a little bit of a complicated diagram here, but what we can see is we have these are fossil fish, these dark areas here. Um, this is another ancient creature called an ammonite that, that uh, the shell starts to shine. We, we won't worry about the ammonite right now. But these dark area of the fish, and here you can actually see the fish, right? There's a fin, there's the head of the fish, fin, tail. And what scientists notice is that when we plot them all, all of them are going in the same direction. And all these fish are um, freshwater fish. They're living in rivers um, close to the shoreline. These fish all washed up ashore as a result of a tsunami and were deposited. Now, the interesting thing and what really uh, catches my attention to this 
is that this tsunami, this one in particular, this exact tsunami, is the one that was caused by the meteor impact that killed the dinosaurs 66 million years ago at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, at the KT boundary that we call here. Um, this meteorite impacted um, basically in the southern basin of the Gulf of Mexico, so along the north shore of um, the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, it's called the Chicxulub Impact Crater. Um, that is very well known, of that impact crater, and it's always been suspected that that is the driving force of, the, of killing the dinosaurs. And here we have exact evidence of a tsunami that could only be generated because of the location that it is, that could only be generated by this um, impact. So these fish actually died as a result of the uh, meteor that killed off the dinosaurs and brought us into the age of mammals. I just thought that was a fascinating find by scientists last year. Um, hopefully you guys found that fascinating as well. And Judah, I hope that answered your question for you. So that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Um, I hope that everybody has learned something new and you're going to be able to now go out and share this newfound knowledge with family and friends. Um, I thank you for joining us and we really look forward to answering your questions next time on Ask a Scientist.